Namaste. So this is the beginning of a new series on Qigong. Intro to Qigong, huh? which is kind of a general background of what about Qi and Qigong and what it is and how it's used and all that. And in the next series, we will get into Yi Jin and Qi Sui. Yi Jin and Qi Sui means muscle changing and brain marrow washing. <laughs> Qigong. These are the two main methods, the external and the internal methods. Now, the problem with, the, with these traditions is that they have been very secretive in the past. They use all kinds of elliptical language and metaphorical imagery that we're just not, you know, culturally prepared to understand. It has to be translated by an expert. It has to be translated by someone who's done the training, actually. And so uh, we're very lucky to have that source uh, in the uh, person of the author, Dr. Yang Jingming. And he has translated all these original things, uh, as far as I can tell, completely accurately, because he doesn't avoid the confidential parts. Uh, he doesn't avoid the parts that would, you would think, you know, would cause uh, a scandal or a conflict of interest, you know, in a public teacher. But he, he handles them in a very straightforward and natural manner, which I very much appreciate. So the marrow brainwashing is the internal qigong, which is very helpful for pursuit of enlightenment. Uh, this has been known for over 1400 years, since the Liang dynasty, huh? 1400 years, but it's probably even older than that. It's probably uh, originally like a, a Chinese folk tradition or forest sage tradition that got mixed up with Buddhism and Buddhism kind of became the philosophical superstructure of this ancient practice. So what we want to do now that we've presented quite a bit of material on Buddha's teaching is show how when Buddhism came to China and merged with the existing Taoist culture it created something completely new. And that was called Chan, or which became in Japan famously Zen. So Chan Buddhism or Zen Buddhism started in China as the marriage between the Buddhist teaching and the already existing Taoist tradition. So how did Indian Buddhism come to China? <laughs> well, it came because there was a split within Buddhism itself. There was a split between the Theravada and the Mahayana. The Theravadans really looked at enlightenment as an elitist thing. Only certain very qualified people, you know, can take this very narrow path that leads to enlightenment. And it's true, you know, Raja Yoga, Jnana Yoga is a very difficult discipline. You know, we've been over it and over it on this channel for years now. And, you know, we haven't ever e even approached the end. <laughs> because beyond a certain point, there's nothing you can say. We can only describe the approach to that point, and from there you have to experience it for yourself. So anyway, the Buddha's teaching, when it hit China, had a tremendous impact on the Chinese society and, of course, also on the religion. In fact, it was such a profound impact that the emperor himself vowed to house and feed all the Buddhist monks in China. He didn't consider that this was a direct violation of the instructions of the Buddha. 
And so, after several generations, it became obvious that although the monks were trying to follow the teachings, they were not reaching enlightenment. Sounds a lot, I mean, it sounds familiar. It sounds a lot like what's happening with Buddhism in the West today. Uh, there's ample material support for many practitioners to practice full time. And yet, anyone reaching any kind of permanent state of enlightenment is very, very rare. And I think they have common causes in the fact that the underlying society has changed so much that following Buddha's original instructions just isn't feasible. Going from house to house and begging, you know, uh, try that in, in Brooklyn. <laughs> you probably get mugged, you know, or anywhere in the West or even in the East. Um, when I visited or when I was a monk in Sri Lanka, not too many years ago, what was that? only three, four years ago. Uh, the last of the wandering monks finally hung up his sandals, you know. <laughs> Actually, they go barefoot. Tough dudes, man. They walk all over the place. But they just found it increasingly difficult to beg, even in a Buddhist country. Huh? Same in Thailand, same in Burma. Myanmar, excuse me. And then in China itself, of course, since the Cultural Revolution, there has been a tremendous impact on the traditions, the spiritual traditions, especially the Qigong tradition, and especially because of its so-called immorality. Uh, it became a target of state suppression in China, in the PRC, People's Republic of China. <clears throat> so um, a lot of the teachers escaped, including my teacher, Mrs. Yu and her husband, Dr. Yang. Different Dr. Yang than the one we were quoting earlier. Um, he was a well-known Zen, Chan, Buddhism uh, teacher. Realized, he was a realized being. And I believe so, so was she. And she had a tremendous impact on me in a very subtle way, huh? and it, only through energy because she hardly spoke English, and of course I spoke no Chinese, other than dim sum, maybe. <laughs> so, you know, pass the duck sauce. Um, what I got out of that experience was that you don't have to talk about enlightenment, but you can show by your energy what is enlightenment. And that really, uh, that teaching has been tremendously valuable for me. Uh, because it's wordless. And of course, we know that enlightenment itself is inexplicable. <laughs> so if we want to avoid the trap of trying to attain enlightenment through some kind of intellectual explanation or adjustment, then we have to do the actual practice. And the best practice is one that involves the body because as I pointed out in a video not long ago, that the Buddha even recommended that if you can train the mind, you know, according to the uh, jhana system of meditation and, and so on, if you can't get right view, you know, if you're not, intellectual enough to get right view by understanding paticca samuppada and stuff like that, the, the process of becoming, then you should base your perceptions and your um, judgments of things on the body. Because the body is far more stable than the untrained mind. <laughs> the Buddha was quite... Uh, firm about it, you know, that you might as well, and, and there's a whole bunch of suttas that involve training the body, taking inventory of the body. Huh? Like, what are you doing when, you, when you're doing hatha yoga, or even when you're getting a massage? Is that your consciousness, your attention, is being directed to all different corners of the body, which we normally don't pay that much attention to. Yeah. But when we put a little force, a little tension, a little pressure on one part of the body and draws the attention there, it also draws our energy there. The qi follows the yi. This is one of the fundamental principles of qigong. The concentrated attention or mind, 
mindfulness draws the energy along with it. You don't have to try. Uh, I hate that word, try. You don't have to, word, you don't have to you know, pretend, uh, which is what try really means. You don't have to pretend to move the chi. Just move your attention and the chi will follow automatically. So, the bra marrow brainwashing, huh? what's it called? Chi sui, chi sui qigong. That's going to be discussed in the next series. Um, and that's the one that involves the sexual practices and so on. But, oh yeah, <clears throat> the point is that all of this was imported into China from India. This is a huge point. Uh, put it up on a billboard in flashing neon lights. Because the Indians want to say, no, the approach to enlightenment is sex repressive, brahmacharya. And that's true if you follow the brahmacharya system from the beginning. This is called naishtiki brahmacharya. The, the person, the male especially, never experiences an orgasm. Oh. Now, if this is done right, one can transition from the food body to the energy body, the pranamaya kosha. And, of course, in the pranamaya kosha, everything is possible, <laughs> including very high-level orgasmic uh, ecstasies through cultivation of devotion and certain kinds of meditation and so on. The third, is it the third or the fourth? The third jhana. Third jhana is ecstasy. Right? Ecstasy is easy. We covered that completely in the Secret of the Golden Flower series. All you have to do is contemplate your contemplation. <laughs> Be conscious of your consciousness. Be aware of your awareness. Huh? And look at yourself, like looking your, at yourself in a mirror but not your body, your, your awareness, your consciousness. So that's the path to ecstasy. Once ecstasy becomes like a normal everyday experience, <laughs> then you can go beyond it, right? Into pure energy, where the, the energy doesn't distinguish what is pleasure, what is pain. What is pleasure, displeasurable, or neutral. Uh, the energy just flows like water. Huh? Water is not afraid of a big fall. It doesn't hold back. <laughs> it just goes, right? Because that's its nature. So, even though sometimes life uh, is very intense, that doesn't necessarily mean it's painful. It's only painful because we judge it that way. You see, so all of these trainings involve some kind of intentional pain, intentional suffering, intentional infliction of intense sensation on the body. And this is the nature of these trainings because remember, they were for martial artists. Huh? <clears throat> but it was also found that the, um, how can I say, the gravity and the strength derived from these exercises is a very good prelude to meditation. In fact, one falls into meditation naturally afterwards, and this is called a valley orgasm. This is something we'll be discussing and actually talking about the uh, practice. So, the internal energy flow of the chi, the life energy, the prana, is closely related to the subtle bodies, the pranamaya kosha, the energy body, the manamaya kosha, the mental body, uh, the vijnanamaya kosha, the intelligence body, and anandamaya kosha, the bliss body. Uh, the, the, the Chinese don't talk about this so much, but the Indians do. And this is where the two come together. Because qigong is nothing but the realization or and full, uh, fully inhabiting the energy body, uh, seeing that you can live as energy, uh, 
and have a very full life. You don't need this meat body. You don't need to drag this bag of bones around everywhere. <laughs> and of course, these experiences, you know, of pure energy being are like recounted in every mystical tradition. Every mystical tradition in history has uh, attained these kind of things. And every mystical tradition, even in the West, ha also has some kind of physical discipline connected with it. But in the West, the physical disciplines have become like disconnected from the pursuit of enlightenment. See, like look what they did to yoga. I mean, yoga is supposed to be the union of the jiva, the living soul, with God, the source. But what it's become is just a bunch of like weight loss exercise routines for housewives. You know, give me a break. No, real yoga, authentic yoga is very deep. But the, even the, the people claiming to teach Ashtanga yoga, which means eight limbs, uh, actually only teach a little uh, asana and maybe a tiny bit of pranayama, you see. So they're only teaching maybe one and a half limbs out of eight. And the reason for that is the same as the reason for the decline in adherence to all organized religions, that the, mod the celibacy model does not work in today's culture. It doesn't work unless it's pursued perfectly. And in today's culture, you know, that's just not feasible. So we need a path instead that develops the first th three chakras to their natural uh, full capability, then they can then support the development of the higher chakras in the traditional way. So what is this another marriage of, of Chinese culture and Indian culture? But instead of bringing the Indian principles to China, we're going to bring the Chinese principles back to India. <laughs> because they originally came from there in the first place. You see, the Qigong principles were part of the culture of the Rajas, the kings in India. And when the Rajas went away in favor of democracy, uh, uh, first uh, the, uh, the Islamic invasion, then the Christian invasion, right? So many invasions were there that wiped out the aristocratic culture of the kings. So when the kings no longer had, you know, skin in the game <laughs> and uh, cultivating warriors, you know, to protect their kingdom, this culture was gradually lost. But it was preserved in China because they still had quite a big martial class. So this tradition had been handed down through the marshals, not the priests, not the religious. Huh? And when the Buddhist uh, mental discipline came to China, the combination of the two was fantastic. Huh? But it was lost in India because the uh, trying to adhere to the ancient tradition of the celibacy became increasingly difficult. And so many of the projects based on that theory are now failing. Uh, and they're trying to mask this by changing the definition of enlightenment to one that's based on only a mental function instead of the um, transcendence of the complete being, all seven chakras. And that's the purpose of secret heaven. Om Tat Sat Buru Saranai.